Welcome back, guys, to a nice, quiet video Hello. with Peter Atkinson and Brian Weissman and the very loud, the, the, very, Don, himself. the Don himself, Daniel Chang. <laughs> <laughs> I have this, uh, you, you know, the fight promoter, Don King? Yeah. So yeah, Brian, he has an alter ego that I, I see. Don <laughs> Ching. You like, <laughs> Random stuff. He's owned it. He's owned it. All yes, right. All right. It. So this video, guys, as promised, is... Uh, a very, very. I'm actually very interested in this video because I never understood Gen Con starting out and kind of where sure, it's gone. Sure, so sure. we're going to talk some about that and yeah. uh, right. talk about your passion for gaming and the direction. So yeah. why don't you just tell us how it all started? Well, Gen Con, you've heard of Dungeons and Dragons, right? Yeah. So Dungeons and Dragons, everybody's heard of Dungeons and Dragons. It was designed by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson uh, back in the early '70s, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, before. Uh, they designed Dungeons the Dragons. Gary Gygax had already started Gen Con. Uh, started in 1967. 67. 1967. What? Started Gen Con in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And there was this was before Magic was created. Geneva. Before Dungeons and Dragons were created. Is right? the Geneva part like where the Gen comes from? Exactly. I've always wondered that yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So it's because of Lake so Geneva. It, yeah, and it was so there were no RPGs. There were no trading card games. Um, it was a war game convention, you know, toy soldier convention. People playing war games with toy soldiers around, running around like, what are you doing back there? <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get me to take my eyes off my cards. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, and soon, about, soon you'll see some white borders. Did, did, did I have six or seven alpha black lotuses? I can't remember. Who do you keep track, right? Yeah, yeah so uh, it, it, he started it as a war gaming convention, and um, and then, you know, a few years later, he invented Dungeons and Dragons, and, uh, you know, so the convention is over 50 years old. Um, it's moved a few times, uh, moved to um, uh, around in, in uh, that part of uh, Wisconsin, uh, eventually moved to Milwaukee, and that's kind of where in the late 80s and early 90s, as, as Gen Con really grew, and the tabletop gaming industry really grew, and just RPGs, and then Magic the Gathering, and, and trading card games, um, it was there, and then so I, during those years, of course, I was running Wizards of the Coast, and um, and we went to Gen Con. It was our favorite thing to do every year. Going to Gen Con was amazing. I remember the first time I went was as a Wizards of the Coast exhibitor in 1992. This is before Magic. We were selling the Prime Order and Palace. Yeah, it was when you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. What, what you what Wizards of the Coast actually did before Magic. Yeah, we did role playing. I I was a big role player. I loved D and D since I since the seventies, and uh, so I started Wizards of the Coast to do RPG products. Right, this is yeah. you know, yeah. and 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 thankfully met Richard Garfield on the way. Came out with Magic. Otherwise, we'd just be another long forgotten did RPG you, company. <laughs> did you meet him at Gen Con? No, I met uh, Richard Garfield. Uh, through a good friend of his named Mike Davis, uh, late Mike Davis now, and um, uh, Mike, Richard was always kind of a, a little bit quiet and reserved, and he was very focused on his school. He, Mike Davis has said, hey, I'm going to go out and pin your games and try and find publishers for your games. Yep. And so Mike Davis was the one that connected with me, and that led to us um, uh, getting together and him designing magic and everything. So. So we were, um, uh, so in late 1997, in late, late in the 90s, we had the opportunity to acquire TSR, which was the company that published Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And Gen Con was still a part of that. So Gen Con was part of the D&D &D company, if you will. That must, so, have, been a, that must uh, have been a surreal moment for you personally, no. in your background with D&D &D and so the, on. The most surreal moment of my life yeah, would have been, been the day that the former owner, TSR, <laughs> came out and handed me the keys to the company, literally. I mean, consider that already. Right? That's irony, right? No, it's not irony. It's coincidence. No, it's neither, actually. It's, it's surrealism. Just, it's surreal, yeah. It's, it's just, surreal. It, uh, you could probably think of some, I, I could probably think of an analogy to it, but the idea that you had spent, that you had spent so much of your youth yeah, playing this game, right. and now here you were actually literally buying the company know, that was, made the game. Yeah, that was that was crazy. That out like out like Geneva. Yeah, yeah. Well, for those that of the people that don't know, what was TSR? Because that's kind it's, of uh, yeah. TSR was a company that Gary Gygax had started to uh, to do Dungeons and Dragons. It was called Tactical Studies Rules, uh, and because uh, in which kind of shows his yeah, board gaming, TSR board, board yeah. gaming roots, right? Yeah, so we acquired. Uh, so that's how I ended up uh, with Gen Con the first time. 1997, and then of course we sold Wizards of the Coast to Hasbro in 1999. Yeah, 
And uh, I stayed on for another year and a half after that, but eventually I left Hasbro and was, you know, the, you know retired, you know, going off playing. Yep. And on my way out the door, I told the guy that took over the company after I left, Vince Galori, I said, Vince, you know, I know that there are some pieces of this company that Hasbro probably doesn't really appreciate. Right, yeah. Uh, and it's probably legitimately off strategy for Hasbro. So I said, if there's ever, uh, if they ever start talking about selling off into this company, be sure and let me know because I might be interested in buying, depending on what it is. So, and so at, I'm sorry to interrupt, but at that point, um, so at that point, Wizards owned, by extension of owning TSR, they owned Gen Con. Yes. It was their yes. property. So, yeah. So Hasbro owned Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast included at that time uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, Gen Con, and uh, the rights to sell Pokemon cards worldwide, except for Japan. In all languages mm. except Japanese. Interesting, just this like thrown in. Yeah, what, is, what does it, it does not forget? The what does it mean to did. own a convention? What does that mean exactly? So, uh, a, well, a convention really is um, the, the the trademark, the right to use that trademark to organize an event. It's okay. really at the heart of value to uh, to that business. Is we own the Gen Con brand, and um, and it's all the uh, the expectation and brand awareness of. Like, this is going to be an event, it's going to be in the summer, it's going to be in the Midwest, and it's all going to be about games. So, it's the asset is that expectation, and then, of course, the legal rights and the trademark to be able to execute against it. And and so, it's, um, uh, yeah, so we sold all that, and so then, we, yeah, Hasbro, uh, Feds gave me a call and said, yeah, you're right, we are going to sell off a few parts of this business. Um, and you know, so, you know, we're selling retail stores. Like, no, I'm not interested in that. We're selling magazines. No, I'm not interested in that. We're selling e-commerce. No, I'm not interested in that. And we're selling Gen Con. Like, Gen Con. Yeah. Isn't it? Really? Was this the time you had Wizards Coast retail stores? Remember that? Yes. Yes. So they wanted to sell that. They they were during that time. They were divesting the. This was uh, in 2002. So so all were, that time, they, they were, all those things I just listed. Wow. Uh, Did that include the game centers. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So. So um, yeah, so we did a deal, and so then in two thousand two, I ended up with Gen Con, and I've owned it ever since. So there's a three year span when wow. they were running Gen Con and managing it and so on. How did how did yeah. the convention do under their stewardship? Well, um, well, two of those years I was there, oh. and I like to think we did really well. With it. <laughs> but so you were still having to run it in yes. after the yeah, after I the mean sale? indirectly. I wasn't, you know, but no, no, no. I'm. We bought it. Uh, Hasbro bought. We bought TSR. Excuse me, nineteen ninety-seven. Yes. Right. Hasbro bought us in nineteen ninety-nine. But I was still running Wizards as a division of Hasbro from nineteen ninety-nine till two thousand. Oh, okay. So post buyout, right. you were still yeah, yeah, working yeah. under their banner. Yes, yes. You weren't just off doing your own thing. No, but there was. I stayed for a year and a half, and then I left in two thousand and one and bought. Bingo. I guess I mean that too. That's yeah. to be expected. That's the way buyouts are normally structured, right? Yeah. Just. You don't have all the senior management just leave. It usually takes about two years for the entrepreneur to realize he sold his business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But usually, often, but often there's loyalty clauses built into the buyout anyway. Right, right. So you have to stick around because you don't want the guys that are running the company to just abdicate and suddenly you're yeah. left yeah. with a company with no leadership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they had no problem seeing me go eventually, though. Yeah. So what year was 2000, <laughs> 2000, you said? Uh, so I left Hasbro in 2001 okay. uh, and then acquired Gen Con 2002. So that was only one year later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. only one year. Yeah. So when I was in that time range, I noticed something called Gen Con SoCal. Is that you guys? Yes. So okay. we did, actually, uh, we did several. When I first bought the show and like, okay, I've got this new business, which is built around Gen Con, and all I'm doing is Gen Con. To me, the growth model seemed to be let's go run more than one show. Let's run multiple conventions, mo hmm. multiple Gen Con shows. And we had some licensed ones. Uh, we had a couple of different Gen Cons happen in Europe around this time. There was Gen Con UK actually had a long track record of hmm. Gen Con shows. There was one in Belgium, there was one in Spain, there was one in Australia, wow. and we did one ourselves uh, in Southern California, in Anaheim. And um, wow. Um, and yeah. yeah, so eventually we concluded the strategy didn't actually work as well as we thought it would be, and uh, we just and we one. got out of all those deals. And re we also did Star Wars shows for uh, we did two Star Wars celebration shows. Um, can, you, can you talk uh, just as, as briefly as, as you can manage about um, the role that Gen Con played in Magic's ascension and spread and popularity? 
Well, I think, yeah, uh, Gen Con, uh, well, Magic first came out, you know, Origins and Gen Con both have some sort of claim as to uh, Magic. First time any cards were shown to the public was at Origins. Uh, we weren't selling, we didn't have packaging or anything That's like that. That's in Ohio. Uh, Origin, yes, yeah. uh, that time it was in, um, I think that particular year it was in Dallas, Fort Worth. It used okay. to move around, but now it's in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Um, and we were managing um, Origins, by the way. Um, oh, we. Uh, Wizards. Um, yeah, because I remember yeah. in 1996, Nationals, U.S. Nationals for Magic was yeah. at Origins that year. Right, right. Um, the, the and, the, right. and then the first time the release of Magic they, you know, was at, at Gen Con in 1993, and that's where we had packaged product, and we were able to sell it, and, and we were promoting it and advertising and all sorts of stuff like that. And it was... Um, uh, I believe it is huge. Of course, I'm, I have vested interest in saying <laughs> yeah. Gen Con's really important, but uh, the reason I acquired Gen Con is because I felt this way before. I mean, that, that you have, okay, in terms of actual numbers of people, at the time, maybe it was only 15, 20,000 people, but these are people who are the influencers right. within the tabletop gaming space, right? These people that came from all over the world to be at Gen Con, uh, companies were orienting their new releases and still do around Gen Con. Uh, the gaming press is there in, in numbers. And uh, Magic made a huge splash at the show. I mean, it was the, the, the game that was down. talked about. It was wow. the game you, you would walk, walk through the hallways and you see people playing on the floor. Uh, you would, you know, <laughs> you go to the cafeteria. You these you know, random alpha cards on the floor. People, yeah, <laughs> cards like these, right? I mean, you see people playing Magic everywhere, and uh, it wow. was, so, and so all those people went back home, and also the distributors were there. When we got home, our fax machine had jammed from <laughs> all the orders coming, coming in, in from, from distributors for, for Magic cards. Crazy. Yeah. Um, what, what month of the year was it held in? in August. 1992? So it was in August of 19. Yeah, yeah, just about every year it's been in August. It's wow. very in July. Yeah. Um, so this this time frame. So. To be clear, um, Origins was a month or two before that, is that correct? Yeah, it's and usually, I think it was early July. And did you actually yeah. premiere anything yeah. there? Or did you have so any we had promotion? cards. Yeah, did did you, did you fun story. Okay, so Alpha. Alpha. Look, Magic yeah. was at the printers. Okay. okay. So we sent Magic to the printers, I think, in May, yeah. and looking forward to getting our shipment of Magic cards in time for Gen Con, which is like the end of July, right? And uh, as you know, as I've told you some of our conversations, we didn't know much about making cards in the day. They were being made by <laughs> you, Luke Merton. Yeah, we didn't have print yeah, you specifications. Need to talk, yeah, you need to talk about the print specifications. <laughs> yeah, yeah we didn't have print actually. specifications. We just told, we told, well, what we insist on, so uh, Luke, magic cards are collectible. They're, they're going to be packaged like baseball cards, but they've got to be poker cards in terms of quality, yeah. like casino poker, like, because, we're gonna, because people are going to collect them, but they're going to shuffle them, yeah. and they're going to play a game with them. That was our print specifications. And, and that Luke was, was the guy that No, that that was was no idea about the corners. In, in color, nothing about the corners. And size so, as well, yeah. which is fascinating. Luke, Luke was he, the guy from yeah, Carter Monday. Right? Luke was Carter, Carter Luke Mernes from Carter Monday, great guy. Um, and by the way, and how, he, why and did you select Carter Monday? Because no one ever... It was, well, it was, it took us, it took us a long time to find any company that could do what we wanted. Oh, right, wow. so it was a very difficult search to, to find. There wasn't that many the choices stuff. back in that day. Well, we didn't know price, price if they were. We didn't. Well. Know. I mean, where oh, do you really? go with a game like this? Where do you go with a game like this? It's casino poker right. card quality for playing and shuffling. Right. But they're packaged and randomly with collation schemes. So the collation randomized of uh, randomizing cards like that is something that occurred in sports cards. Right. But sports cards are crappy value comparatively. Right. You can't shuffle sports they're cards. Sh they're, they're like yeah, they just yeah. fall apart. It's they, like cheap cardboard. They don't pass the cur the Ben test or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think they flip out we no, did the no, Ben test? No, no. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, don't I walk. Don't make my time. Don't make my heart stop. I don't want to make somebody start. But honestly, that's, yeah. it's just one of those. Four, there's well, so this many, was a proxy. You can do it. Yeah. There were so many. Oh, oh my God. It is a oh, proxy. Oh, my God. You I got to edit the color that on that thing. looks a little weird. That? You got to edit that if, out. If, if, okay. if you would beat me two out of three. This yeah. deck, by the way, guys, this video, these cards are actually a great story. We'll have some gameplay between Brian and Right. And Peter, but anyway, back to the story. Okay. Uh, yeah, we were at the part, the part of Gen Con starting out uh, at uh, the very beginning. Okay, so uh, oh, Magic. you'd ask about origins. So origins. What happened yeah. is that, that Magic was being printed at Card of Monday in Belgium. I'm not expecting to see cards for another month, and it's it's the morning I'm going to Origins. In the morning, as I'm just about ready to leave, catch my plane to fly to Dallas, 
I get a call from Luke Murphy, a card one day, and he tells me that the first Magic cards have been printed. Wow. And I'm like, well, wow. I'm not expecting this for another month. But of course, the process of making Magic cards, you print the cards, and then you sort the cards, and then you got to package them. Was it done by packs hand? Was it done by stuff. hand? Well, there are machines and stuff like that. But the yeah. point is that it's a process. And so you think about it, it's actually getting cards off the presses fairly early in that process. And um, and so, but I was surprised, like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense, you got cards. And he says, do you want, us, do you want me to send you some cards? Well, yeah, send me some cards. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, send them to, I send them, I got out my notebook and like my, my you know, back in those days, you use a little journal or your, right, your, right. your calendar. Like I got the name of the hotel, mail them to me at this hotel in Dallas, Fort Worth. <laughs> Uh, overnight mail, <laughs> and and so I go, I go to Origins, and, and then the next day so these sick. magic cards how many show you, up. How these many are the first send? magic cards I ever saw. Wow. How many did right? he so, send to you? What he took yeah. one in each press sheet, one common, one uncommon, wow. one rare, and they were cut up. So it was what three hundred and sixty-three yeah. well, cards. And did they have? Did they have? The, did they have their backs? Mm. Or were they, well, it's 11 by 11 oh, times 3. It's 11 by 11. 11 by, yeah, 100. Oh, you're hitting it with all three, the other. 300, yeah, yeah, it's 363 cards. cards. Yeah. Right. Did, um, and, and did they have bags or were they yeah, white bags? Yeah, they were real magic cards. They were real magic cards. These are the first cards. These are the first, first, alphas, first, ever. first alphas ever. First alphas ever. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so we tried to build decks, but if you think about it, you don't have enough land really in that no, scenario to build very good decks. But we did. We built decks and we showed them at Origins. No sleeves. Of course, next week. You, we hadn't even thought of the idea of putting it. I have to ask. I have to people, ask. People weren't using sleeves when I started playing no, we didn't, in 94. We didn't have sleeves. I have to, I have to ask people that don't know. Yeah. yeah. They're, so, okay. they're, so, they're okay. so, yeah. such an integral yeah. part of how you play Magic now that right. the idea we, that... No, we that, didn't. We didn't. There was no conception. It was just commanded. We didn't have any conception that people would right. pl put cards in sleeves. And, and, of course, it didn't take long before people did, but it was not something we anticipated. So then at Gen Con, you told an amazing story about the uh, the lack of product. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was the origin story of Magic. So yeah, so Magic was at Origins in 1993, but uh, we weren't really selling it there. Uh, so the big release was at Gen Con, and uh, of course we bet the whole company on this, right? Everything, all this anticipation of having um, Magic there and how much it costs and everything. It's rolling the dice in a big way, of course. And so we go to Gen Con, uh, we set up our booth. It's uh, the show starts on Thursday, so it's Wednesday at the show, and um, uh, our product hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> so we got we got we have a booth. We, we have a booth ready to go. We have our booth. So what product, are you guys doing at the booth? The product, the magic cards, <laughs> were being shipped directly to there huh. from Card Monday. Did you at least have a couple of decks or anything with you? You must yeah, have yeah. We I had some. Idea. We had we had stuff to show. You know, we had to, but we had no product to sell. Right, right? Of and. Um, uh, and so it's and so then Thursday the show starts Thursday morning I go down to the Lowe's loading dock and like no there's still no magic cards Thursday morning <laughs> all day Thursday I'm just like oh I'm just visions of this company ending in disaster. Oh my God. Uh, Are you guys and, all drinking and, your adult beverages at that point? Uh, no. Not, <laughs> not to sell. So I'm going back uh, throughout the day on Thursday. I'm going back to the loading dock every couple hours or at least it was we were in wow. no, no sign of cards Friday morning. Still no cards. Cards did not arrive until Friday early afternoon, like around one or two o'clock. And so we had, thankfully they did, right? So better late than never. Uh, we had, of course, gamers had heard about magic. There was already starting to be a bit of a buzz, right? It, in, and so the people were waiting around the booth and finally we got the word, magic cards are here. And so the people that were waiting at the booth, we just enlisted them. They follow us back to the loading dock. We all picking up oh cases. The so whole, whole whole train. Imagine, <laughs> I just, Al, imagine, imagine <laughs> cases of Alpha. Imagine here. Hold this, yeah, please. Yeah, imagine twenty gamers. Don't run off with this in story and store it for <laughs> for twenty five years because it'll be worth like ten million dollars. <laughs> we go to the booth. We open it up and we start selling them and. Um, uh, yeah, and it was it was crazy. Well, and it took and, and so it was really exciting there for a few minutes because there was like maybe twenty people yeah, who were waiting around, buzz, right? around yeah. to buy magic cards. Well, okay, an hour later, those twenty people bought their cards. They they run off to go play, yeah. and and now you're back to 
just demoing the game like any other day, game. And Magic in 1993 was not an easy game to demo. I mean, it probably isn't now, right? I mean, it's not. It's a tricky game. But you're trying to explain to someone that each player needs their own deck of cards, and the decks aren't the same, and uh, and you can buy more cards, and you decide which cards are in All these things that now we see as virtues right. of Magic. And wonderful things. are very but, common places. But these are all barriers to entry from somebody who's seeing the game for the first time. Totally. And you're, you're explaining all that to them, and, and a lot of people are like, oh, you mean I gotta buy two decks? <laughs> well, speaking of that, Peter, Peter, what was the MSRP back in the day for Star Deck? Seven ninety five, right? Yeah, boy, so, I think it was. I think it was seven ninety five. And then I the booster right. pack yeah. was, I think Arabia's was a dollar forty five, but uh, booster pack dollar ninety five. Booster packs of Alpha Beta were, I think, two forty five. Two forty five, right? So, speaking of what you just said, you have to buy two. Was money back in the early nineties like that? Was that a consideration for people? Yeah, it was definitely a consideration. So, you know, you don't have the trading card game market yet. It doesn't exist. Right. So yeah, you're selling secondary all market. these to RPG people. Yeah. Got right. it. And the board games wasn't very big either like in this industry. This industry was mostly war games and RPGs. And, um, yeah, yeah, it was. It's a different time, you know. It's, it's, what it's was, for, for, for 20 bucks, you could go buy one of the best D&D games on the market. That was my yeah, exact. So, what would what would you uh, estimate is the total budget for a gamer back in that day? Anything that was over twenty bucks was problematic. I mean, if you had really, a, yeah, if you had a, if a game was over twenty bucks, that was uh, that would be a a, a serious um, obstacle to overcome. Uh, to get some yeah, wow. I mean, yeah, yeah, to, to overcome. It, it it better be the newest, you know. Uh, so people, RPG hardcover with uh, filigree. People weren't bringing five hundred or a thousand dollars just no, to buy a bunch of cards no, no, and yeah, stuff. One of, one of the things that wow. I, um, one of the anecdotes that I've repeated a number of times about, certainly with regards to how you guys were able to justify putting stuff like this into the inaugural set, in addition to it just being exciting and fun, was the idea that because the precedent that had been established was that people did not spend more than 20 to $30 on a given hobby in gaming up to that point, that you didn't have to worry about hoarding. You didn't have to worry about consolidation of power level yeah, we didn't, in a small population of gamers. Right, right. Yeah, it, it was um, inconceivable. I mean, um, I remember Scaff and Richard having this conversation about how the game could be degenerate if you had enough lotuses and whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, but it was it was inconceivable that anybody would. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, been, nobody like, had done that before. There's so, a de there's a general other, yeah. other than human now, behavior I, in general. I mean, it's not fair to say that nobody spent that kind of money on games. I mean, Games Workshop was a thing by then for sure. You yeah. know, there were people that had hundreds of dollars worth of their of armies for <laughs> hundreds miniature. of dollars. But obviously, right. in modern yeah. context, where you have people that have collections that are worth multiple millions of dollars. It's just totally unthinkable no, yeah, from totally. the yeah, paradigm yeah. that existed in the early yeah. 1990s. Yeah. That anybody, that that behavior would even exist at all. Right. And if you have a small population of players like the guys at Gen Con who are playing for anti, playing with their cards out of sleeves, right. destroying them, passing right. them around, yeah. and eventually moving on to something else, you don't have this problem right. where some guy has 10 yeah. ancestral recalls. Yeah. There's one ancestral recall in the population of eight guys playing right. for anti that right. passes, changes hands yeah. for a while. Right. Exactly. And then that's fine. Yeah. And that was sort of the original intent of the game. So Alpha yeah. 40, even though it's vaunted as being this sort of throwback right. encapsulation of the way the game actually was, it would be much better to play what you were talking about, which is these sort of pre-con decks from that era, which it's is just much make more a, similar yeah. to what people, yeah. or draft from that era, which yeah, is you're, more similar to what you would have had. If you want to know what it was like, you take a, a deck and two booster packs, you know, and you open it up and you build the best deck you can. You're lucky, yeah. you're you're lucky, got, you're lucky if you can get down to three colors. Exactly. <laughs> if you've got enough lands, right? Right. That, 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 that includes lands. Problem. You get like a Let's, pestilence and you only have one swamp. <laughs> Right. I mean, the, with the land problem, I mean, that that, that was quickly. I mean, people, you know, would have had half Yeah, like, well, we should at least get. But I remember playing in limited events, sealed deck events at the very, very beginning when you had to play with the lands that you were given. You could not add. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, and that, that, eventually, that there, was, there was eventually a rule that, that, I think this even actually went all the way into the Pro Tour, where you were out, allowed to add five lands to your deck, five basic lands you could add, up yeah. to five. And then you had to play with the lands you were given, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this is amazing. So, you're going to Gen Con. I'm closing my eyes thinking of this. You got the product finally. People finally got the, the, the diehards were there getting their product. Yeah. 
Right. Then you demoed the game. Then you're demoing it. Then you told me two something. Two gamers at a time. One, two, three yeah, gamers yeah, at a time. What happened in the okay. subsequent? And then, and then so, they came but, back. Yeah, so, so, okay, sorry. so, yeah, so Friday you're, you're doing the, the, the hard sell, you know, and then... <laughs> Uh, the hard then, sell. Then, then Saturday, the hard uh, you're still sell. doing the hard sell, but then uh, every once in a while, <laughs> but you're getting all these people that you sold, we sold cards to on Friday. They're all coming back on Saturday, and they're just so they're excited. They're like, only. wow, we, this is amazing. We played this game all night long. Now, what was it you were telling us about booster packs? <laughs> <laughs> And like, yeah, yeah tell yeah, me about booster those packs, booster you know? packs. And so you get about, you show them, like, so now we can just take those cards and just stick them right in our deck. You what know? a crazy idea. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, all of them? Yeah. Now, maybe you don't want all of them in your deck. It's not just a matter of deciding which card you want in, but maybe deciding which card you don't want in yeah. your deck. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll take. And then Sunday, all those same people are coming back. <laughs> Can we just buy a whole box? <laughs> <laughs> How did that feel to you? When I mean, that was great. I mean, yeah, I was like, so valid. Oh, right. Well, the next day, yeah. So that's yeah. So you know, Monday uh, we flew home and I went and quit my job at Boeing. What? Yeah. The next day. They, yeah. Well, the next day. Yeah, I had for the first wow. three years of Wizards, I was running Wizards in the at night. Yes. And working at Boeing in the day. What were you at Boeing, job. by the way? You mind? I was I was a I was a rocket engineer. You're you're also engineering background. Yeah, I was doing as I was uh, technically a systems analyst. So I okay. spent about half my time doing engineering, and about the other half my time writing pro, writing code. Okay. So I wrote code to do analysis. You're develop, of, develop. of rocket systems. And and, and, uh, and Richard was also Boeing. No, 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 no he was a. University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, he, was a a yeah. he was a mathematician yeah, he was professor. He was in the doctorate program. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. where yeah. all the all the Playtest guys were all in that program. Oh. I believe, or nearly all. Well, they were all University of Pennsylvania. All they weren't all in mathematics, yeah. but they were all in the various different uh, yeah. disciplines around there. So there, I think yeah. all grad students. So. Yeah. But yeah, I, I uh, you know because I we didn't have enough money to pay me a salary, so I had to keep my Boeing job for three years to. You know, live off of. Right? So, yeah. So the, but that, Gen Con that, was the validation. That, that Gen Con was Group the concept. validation. Yeah, that was concept like, there was so much excitement. Well, leading up to it, right. um, the product that we, the product that we took, right. um, the product that we didn't sell to consumers, the distributors who were at the show bought everything right. that we yeah. took to the show. Because I had heard, yeah, that yeah. the entire print run of Alpha was sold at Gen Con, but you're, what you're saying is that no, 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 no. All the key was sold. Yeah, everything we brought with us was but sold. But there was still additional stuff yeah, that all the stuff snapped up immediately yeah. afterwards. Yeah, and it was sold. Um, we had, um, I don't remember exactly, I think it was about a third of the Alpha print run that we took to Gen Con and sold. At, at oh, Gen so Con. you didn't I'll bring all of it? Right, no. Okay. There was a, it's, but, only it's too much. But yeah. the rest of it was sold in like the next week. Like we went, well, like I said, when we got home, the fax machine was jammed up with distributors ordering product. And, do you recall how? Do you recall how many boxes that was, or how many cases that was at all? No, I could, I could paint an image for you though. Uh, this is funny. Well, yeah, when yes, when yeah. Magic arrived, uh, I was I was in a house at the time. Okay, yeah. and, uh, down in Kent, and um, the house, the the garage we were renting, we were renting this house. The garage was full of RPG products. Talisana and Primal Order, stuff like that. Other, well, well, other yeah, Watson products. Other Watson products. Too. Yeah, so when the semi pulled up with the first magic shipment, we we, we we got it out and we sorted it based on which distributors it was going to right. wow. in the yard. In the yard. In the yard. Oh and my god, this is just, like a billion dollars. This is your dad's house, dad's house. Sitting in your front yard. That's and so we just hoped it didn't rain that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was sitting there one night in Seattle. Oh my god, god. that is unbelievable. You are no. <laughs> it's obvious. All of Alpha. Oh. If, it, if it rains that night, it's The world well, turns I'm out sure, very I'm sure, yeah. Oh this is like, my yeah. god. <laughs> I'm sure they knew that it's not going to rain. A lot of sprinkler It's Seattle, are. man. For God, whatever. It's Seattle. Come on, it rains. Seattle it. Times has great Three weather. Three quarters weather. of the solstice parade are, get almost yeah, right. Yeah. So, so, it, it all set outside until the next day. When you, unbelievable. Did you, you have security? Do you have anybody right. keeping an eye on it? You guys just went to bed. Oh, what? I mean, lived in the house. I mean, I like, know, but well, you know. There's no security. Peter, what was the approximate revenue yeah. that you, uh, for sales for Alpha? Yeah, but well, I'll like get... it all goes together. I mean, yeah, I know our, around, our yeah. revenue in uh, 1991 before Magic the Gathering was okay. like uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and our revenue in 1992. 1993, the year Magic came out, our revenue was two million bucks. That's a sh- S-H, yeah, that's a crap yeah. load of money. 
well, back they, in the day. Ten X or yes. order of magnitude. Well, and then the more. next year, was and then the next year was like ridiculous. Dollars. Yes. Exactly. So, as a businessman at, at that point, I mean, I don't know if you can share this. Were you half owner? Were you? Well, what was the stake? In? I was smaller. I mean, I I you had, had a, no. I I uh, yeah. Ten, know, 10%? I had no money to put into it. Got um, it. I had co-founders. Um, you know, I, I at the end of the day, you know, when it was all said and done, yeah, I had less, you know, just a few percent. Sure, sure. The company. But the reason why, I'm, I'm, the point I'm going to get is you quit your job because as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, right. you quit your job because not really the money was just necessarily flowing in, but it was what you were, what you wanted to do with your life. Well, at the, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I kept the Boeing job for the first three years because as a practical matter, I needed the income to survive off of because right. all the money that we raised from investors went to either employees I hired or to making product. Right? Right. But so you're that, saying that when you quit your job, you knew that that was Yeah, different. I felt confident. I mean, that after that Gen Con, you know, seeing seeing wow. the way people responded to it at the show was like, yeah, it was pretty convincing. You, you said something that was very fascinating to me fascinating. about the cost of the entire Arabian Nights print run, which you said in your recollection is $88,000. Yeah, yeah. I'm very curious to know if you can recall what the cost of the print runs of Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited were individually. I, I can't do it in my head. I mean, I could estimate it. On back, An estimate back, would be... I, I'd have to get out calculator and like go back and look at how many numbers... I mean, are we talking 50000 for all to produce all of Alpha, something like that? I mean, it seems like that would be about right. How about this? Less than a nice. less than a hundred thousand. No, I think uh, to print all of Alpha, I don't know. I think it was around a hundred thousand because you know you're putting it was an initial because yeah. you're putting it in decks, you know, and um, yeah, the, the cost. And stuff. Oh, the that's co- true. The cost of goods sold, the cogs on the decks was higher on a per card basis than it was in and boosters, right? Because starters yeah. are harder to produce. Um, yeah, the starters, the, starters, the starters also had the um, the rule rules, book, the yeah, rule, yeah. rule booklet in there, and um, right. all that stuff like that. Yeah, just a lot. Of yeah, the margins weren't as good on the starters. All right, so before we go to part two of this video, I got to cut because at the time. Um, I always get to ask this question. When they f- remember, I imagine Gen Con, they're playing with no sleeves, sitting around in their right. on the floors. Right. How many would would you say these cards were destroyed? Did people actually keep them? Did you see people throw them away? They give them away. What 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 well, was I that? I never saw anybody throw away magic yeah. cards. I don't think I ever saw. Anybody but but throw but you know what I mean? Like yeah, it, took, it took until Fallen yeah. Empires. Did you did you did that. you hear these? You know, like did you see them just sitting on tables? What was the deal? Yeah, I mean, it'd be like any other game pieces. You know, your people weren't um, weren't taking care of cards the way. Right. Uh, I mean, it didn't take long before people started to take care of cards that they were in the know, especially you know and. Um, especially rare cards and stuff like that. But, you know, there was, um, I think it took about two years to get to the point That's the where, answer where, I did, yeah, two where, years. Where, where magic wow. was being properly, everybody was playing. But that's, bro, that, that's an insane amount of time yeah, for my, cards to be gone. My recollection, um, yeah. again, because I started in yeah. January, I did not play in sleeves. There was this one guy who played at the student center, at yeah. the student union at UC Santa Cruz, who did have them. Yeah, if, this is January 94? Uh, this is probably February of 94. Yeah. And he had sleeves, and I looked on him with scorn. Right. I thought that he was being, you know, anally retentive and that this behavior was ridiculous. But then over the next few months, I watched my own collection degrade. Right. And I decided maybe he was on something. One thing that is important to recognize is that there were no companies producing sleeves for Magic Cards. You could go and get baseball sleeves. You could, right. There were sleeves right, right. that existed for other products, but there was nothing specific for right. Magic, right. which made it much worse. And in fact, from an aesthetic perspective, you had, if you put your card inside of a sleeve that existed then, right. it was totally ill-fitting. You'd have this big floppy end right. on the end of it. So playing with these cards that had these big floppy tops on them felt right. awful. Right, because the cards were sized oh. by Europeans, exactly. right? Exactly. Because our first printer was Card of Monday, and Card of Monday was a European company. Yeah. And so they printed, the, what is it, the, the 68 by 33 or whatever uh, size of a magic card. Yeah, yeah. Or millimeters. millimeters. Yeah. yeah, whatever those dimensions are were sized for what was... A popular in the European market for casino cards. For casino cards, ah. yeah, because you guys gave them no, and you guys gave them no size specifications no, at all. They no, just had no, a wing, just, yeah, and the corners too, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, we never told them about what? what diameter the corners should be. I mean, no, we yeah, didn't get to that in another. All right, so we'll get down to the next segment here. Uh, the next segment, we're actually going to uh, thank you again, Peter, for your time, you're Brian. We got another segment here. Next part, we're going to talk about about uh, how the tra- Gen Con's transformed. And, and to kind of what it's today. And we'll talk more about what's uh, the bright future, what's going on. All right, thanks, guys. All right. That's a great history lesson. Take care.